My name is Patrick Ashley. I'm one of the senior deputy directors here at DC Health. Uh, and today, on behalf of Muriel Bowser, Mayor Muriel Bowser, we're going to talk about uh, the uh, launch of our Test Yourself Express uh, Rapid Antigen Test Program. Uh, so this program uh, is going to provide a supply of rapid antigen tests across our library sites uh, in the district. And so we'll start on Wednesday of this week uh, with eight library locations where you can pick up these tests at. Uh, and these are in addition to our current Test Yourself uh, program that we have operating at 36 libraries throughout the district. So as I mentioned, uh, this program, uh, the Test Yourself Express program, is going to be at eight libraries starting on Wednesday. Uh, and this is in addition to our current Test Yourself program that's at 36 libraries currently. Uh, and the difference is that uh, our current program, the Test Yourself program, provides at-home PCR-based testing. And so this is the t same testing that you see at many of our public uh, locations throughout the city at our firehouse testing uh, and what we've referred to throughout this pandemic as the gold standard of testing. Uh, and so these tests go back to a laboratory uh, and those they're processed just like any test that you would see at your healthcare provider. And so uh, those are available uh, at the community libraries and available. Uh, and they're very easy to use uh, and they provide uh, very definitive answers as to uh, whether or not you currently have COVID-19 or have been infected with COVID-19. Uh, but the, the reality is, is those uh, t uh, PCR based tests do take a few days to come back. Uh, and we know that uh, we want individuals to uh, reduce the spread of the virus in the community. And so there's a time and a place to take an antigen test kit. Uh, and so uh, these uh, Test Yourself Express kits uh, are going to be available at those eight libraries. And they provide an opportunity for you to get real time results of w within 15 minutes of whether or not you currently have uh, COVID-19. Uh, it's important to note that antigen tests are slightly less specific uh, than PCR-based tests. And so uh, we want to uh, make sure we highlight the reasons for taking an antigen test kit. Uh, most importantly, the reason to take an antigen test uh, is if you're symptomatic. Uh, and we want you to take an antigen test kit within the first couple of days of you being symptomatic because we know that antigen tests are far more likely to uh, show a positive result, a reliable positive result, uh, within the first couple of days of symptoms. We also want you to take an antigen test kit uh, if you've been in some sort of high-risk environment uh, where you might have been exposed to COVID-19. And with COVID-19 all throughout the community right now, uh, we want individuals to be able to rapidly access those results. We do treat antigen test kits as uh, presumptive results, uh, meaning that if you are positive, you should interpret that result as a positive result uh, unless uh, you've talked to your doctor and they've told you otherwise. Uh, we'll have these at the eight libraries. We'll have initially a thousand kits per library per day. Uh, individuals can pick up uh, two kits, uh, which is a total of four tests uh, per person per day at the library. Uh, this is limited currently to DC residents uh, and you must bring some form of identification or some other uh, proof of uh, residency within the, the district and so that could include a piece of mail with your name and address on it. Uh, we also know that our neighbors around us also have similar uh, rapid antigen programs uh, at their local libraries and so uh, we recognize that this is all around and we want all, the, all of our residents to have the opportunity to take advantage of this program. Uh, with that, uh, we're going to go through a demonstration. Uh, Reverend Bowen uh, is going to walk us through uh, the current version of the, the rapid antigen test that we have, uh, followed by Zoel, who's going to talk about or walk us through the uh, Test Yourself program uh, in that kit. So, Reverend Bowen. Thank you. Um, so, go ahead. Uh, first, it's very, it's very important. Can you hear me now? First, it's very important that you have a level and clean service. And then you must thoroughly wash your hands, surgical style, but if you don't have soap and water, the hand sanitizer will do. Next, you take the box. Lay out the materials on the table.
and then you open up the test strip. Next, you take the swab. It's important that you don't touch the tip with your hands. So you want to open it from the bottom. Then you insert the swab into your nostril, about a half an inch, and you want to act as if you're, you're doing a slight cleaning of your nostril. And you want to rotate uh, five times, five times. So it's very important here that we're making sure that we're getting a good swab technique uh, and that we're getting it all the way around the inside of the nose multiple times. Uh, and each one of these kits have instructions that specifies a specific number of times. Uh, you can swab more than that, but it's really important that we make sure that we use good swabbing technique, really getting around the whole inside of the nose on both nostrils. Both nostrils. Next, you open up the solution. And you want to turn it for about 15 seconds. Once you get to the end of the 15 seconds, you want to squeeze the bottom of the tube to make sure the liquid gets onto Seal it back. Then you open the tip. And then you put three drops. And it's marked so you can be clear. Put the tip back on and you wait 15 minutes. And it's very important that you wait 15 minutes uh, or whatever the manufacturer's instructions are uh, before you read those results. Uh, and so it's very important that there's instructions with each kit uh, that you're, you're paying special attention to. Uh, currently the test that we're gonna be distributing is made by iHealth. Uh, it's a possibility throughout this program that the kits may change and so the instructions might uh, vary slightly. Um, and so once those 15 minutes are up, uh, you'll be able to read the results uh, via the line uh, on the test. Uh, so one line on this particular test means that uh, the test is working as appropriate and that it's negative. Uh, if there's two lines, uh, it's a positive test result. And then we want you to make sure that you're isolating yourself and taking all the precautions that are necessary uh, if you were to be COVID positive with any sort of result. Uh, it's very important with these results that uh, you report these to the district uh, Department of Health or DC Health uh, so that we know whether you're negative or positive and we can follow up with you. Uh, you can do that via coronavirus.dc.gov slash over the counter. Again, that's coronavirus.dc.gov slash over the counter. Fill out a simple form uh, and tell us who you are, what date you took the test and what your result was. Uh, unlike traditional laboratories, which are required to report this information to us, uh, because you're taking these at home, uh, we have no knowledge of you, you taking those tests. And so for our surveillance purposes uh, and understanding what the disease is doing in the community, it's really important both those positive and negative results. Uh, it's also important for both of these uh, test programs uh, that you're taking these tests uh, outside of the library. Uh, as, as Reverend Bowen mentioned, uh, you need a flat surface, you need to wash your hands. Uh, and so please take the time to, to do these programs somewhere that's stable, not walking down the street, um, and, and so that we're, we're really uh, making sure we're getting accurate results. Uh, next, uh, Zoelle is going to show us uh, a walk through the uh, PCR-based uh, Test Yourself uh, program that's available here at the library. So uh, I'm not sure if my mic will reach, so I will narrate for, uh, I'll narrate for Zoelle. Yep. Uh, so is gonna start by opening up the uh, pouch uh, and then she's gonna sanitize her hands uh, just like Reverend Bowen did. Again, we wanna make sure we're doing that to get a, a clean sample that's free of any contaminants. Uh, and just a reminder that we're always wanting people to wash their hands and use hand, hand sanitizer uh, whenever possible. 
Uh, so like the, the Test Yourself Express kit, uh, it does come with uh, instructions. Uh, and so it's important that you read those instructions and be very familiar with them. Uh, and so just like for both kits, take some time to read them. They've got pictures uh, that help you to understand what's going on. Uh, within the kit, uh, in addition to the instructions, you've got a tube uh, and a swab on it. And so before we get started, Zoelle uh, is going to take the time to, to pair this to her uh, with a phone by going to testyourself.dc.gov. Uh, with uh, you're going to insert the two different numbers that are on that tube. Uh, Zoelle has already done that for this kit, so we're going to move right uh, to the swabbing. So Zoelle is going to do the same exact thing that uh, Reverend Bowen did, uh, and that's getting really good swab technique here, uh, making sure we're getting around the inside of the nostril, through both nostrils, uh, being careful not to touch the tip of the, the swab. Once she's done with that, she's going to put the swab in uh, tip down into the tube. She's going to securely close that cap. Make sure it's secure. Uh, and then she's going to put it inside the biohazard bag. That's just to make sure that uh, we keep it nice and safe. And uh, if there's any leaks, we have it contained. She's going to roll that up so it fits nicely in the envelope. put it inside that envelope and seal it. Uh, and then Zoelle's gonna drop it in the test yourself uh, box. Uh, it's important to remember for the test yourself uh, kits that were PCR based, that the same day that you register them, you have to drop them off by 8 p.m. Uh, if you don't drop them off by 8 p.m. or you don't register them before you drop them off, they'll be discarded and you will not get a result. Uh, so very important to make sure you do that step. Uh, we see individuals that will return them uh, without doing that. Uh, and unfortunately, we're unable to know who it belongs to, and therefore, uh, we can't get them a result. So with that, uh, happy to take a few questions. Hey, Patrick. Thanks for the demonstration, all of you. I wanted to ask about uh, DC's COVID data. The past uh, two days, we've seen no data reported. Uh, recently, we had 1,200 people, as you acknowledged yesterday, who had their test results delayed. What's happening with the city's data right now? Sure. Uh, so I think it's important to note we're, we're one day on data. So uh, yesterday's data that we normally release Mondays uh, has not, not yet been posted. Um, that data uh, we, it was available uh, this morning, uh, and so it's going through the final process right now of getting posted to our website. Uh, these are complex data systems. Uh, that's the reality of it. Uh, it takes us a tremendous amount of time uh, and processing power to do uh, things like we talk about deduplication to make sure that if people take two different uh, test results, uh, one from their lab, uh, one from their doctor's office, maybe one from test yourself, that we're not double counting those cases. And so when we see high volumes of tests, Sometimes that takes us a little bit longer. It takes us a little bit uh, digging in just to make sure that data is accurate. And so we will soon post that data. Thanks. And so that's expected today? It is. Okay. And for clarity, could you just kind of walk through what goes into the daily case numbers that DC gets? Like what happens when you all get tests and submit them to a lab? Like which lab is it? Which company do the test results go to? And how does DC get the numbers back? Yeah, so I think uh, if you're talking specifically about the Test Yourself program, uh, these are partner uh, that we partner with LabCorp, as we've done since July of uh, 2020. Uh, and so these Test Yourself kits go back to LabCorp and get processed through. Uh, there's a multiple different systems, and so you're using a, a front end of that system that interfaces with our lab partner. Uh, and so there's data that's flowing back and forth, both to get to LabCorp, as well as to get back uh, to us to be able to provide back results. Uh, if you're talking about you know, the overall contact tracing system and our data and how all of that works together, uh, we do require laboratories to report data to us. Uh, that's been a requirement since the early part of the pandemic. All of that data flows into our complex data systems. There's a number of different tools that we use to look at that data, analyze that data, start doing contact tracing with that data. We also, it's really important that we make sure that data is accurate. Thanks. Uh, so we make sure that data... We make sure that data is accurate, and so we go through deduplication processes. We make sure we go through certain checks and balances to make sure the data is adding up. And so that's why you see sometimes the data takes a little bit longer, um, and, and, and that's, that's the reality of it. Thanks. And how confident should the public be that the numbers DC is reporting are accurate, considering the complexity of the data you're talking about? 
Yeah, I think DC should be very comfortable with that. And I think what you see is that we're intentional about when we release that data, right? So we don't release data until we're ready to release the data. Uh, DC Health uh, analyzes that data, uh, and then it goes off to, off to be published to the website. There's no other third-party review of that by uh, any other office of the, the, the government. Uh, we, put, we take that data as soon as we have it available. We provide that analysis out to the public. So... It is actually three days. It, it's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday are the days that yep. we're waiting, not one day. Yep. So, so do you know those numbers? And, do, you know, we saw Wednesday was over 500, which was a record setter. Then the next day was over 800, which again set a new record. Can you tell us, did Friday, Saturday, and Sunday continue that trend of even greater numbers than the previous day? And yes. Do you know I, the numbers? Can you tell us the numbers? Yeah, I can, I can tell you the numbers. Uh, so. Uh, we saw a, a little bit over 3,700 cases uh, over that three-day period. Uh, and so every day we have seen an increase in cases. Uh, and so we expect that to continue. Uh, that's the way that uh, COVID-19 spreads. We know it's in the community. That's why we want people to take these layered mitigation strategies to get tested, uh, making sure they're being really mindful as we go into the holiday season of uh, you know, how that they can prevent the spread of COVID in the community. So I appreciate that. Do you know how many tests were administered? Can you put that into some context for us? I, I don't have the memory of Dr. Nesbitt, so okay. we'll get that to you. And, and uh, do you soon. know, yep. I mean, we're seeing, I mean, you saw the lines here today to pick up the Atom. Down at Farragut, the line wraps literally around the block with more than 100 people waiting to get tested. Can, I think that last week you told me you were at about 15,000 a day. What is that number now? Yeah, Mark, let me get back to you on the specific number. We're obviously seeing a, a tremendous demand. Um, and so, and, and that's great. We want people to get tested. Uh, we talked about yesterday that about a third of the volume comes from public testing sites, uh, whether that's our test yourself program or our, uh, our uh, uh, location at Farragut Square. Uh, it's important, and I talked about this yesterday, and I really want to emphasize this today. Uh, we see everybody wants to get tested, right? Especially with the Test Yourself program, which is super convenient. Uh, we also see that people will come and take 5, 10, 15 samples at a time. And so we want people to be friendly to their neighbors, right? And realize that everybody wants to be tested. And what we hear from these people that take 15 of these tests that are available is that, you know, they want to have them available for next week or the following week or, 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 or beyond that. What we see is less than 50% of our Test Yourself kits that we distribute out to the community are actually ever returned. And what that means is when you're taking that many tests, you're actually depriving your neighbors of their ability to get a test as well. So we're constantly restocking those kits uh, and we're constantly trying to make testing available. The reality is everybody is trying to get tested before they travel for the holidays and are nervous about Omicron in the community. So do the test kits have a shelf life? The test kits do have an expiration date. Uh, they're about six months, uh, you know, so they, they can, you know, they can be kept for a little while, but we don't want people to do that. We want people to only take what they need for a couple of days, maybe a week. And then, I mean, you're describing a hoarding situation, which we have seen for the past 20 months on everything. What is, and we know that your supply, you talked about your supply of the rapid test mm -hmm. kits. What is your supply of the at-home self-test kits? Because this morning, it was a feeding frenzy here when the test finally showed up. And it looks, I mean, people have been nonstop streaming to get them. Yep. Do you have enough of those to keep up with what you have said is going to be an increased demand? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, and so we do have enough raw materials of that. Uh, ultimately, we had a supply chain disruption that was because we could not make emergency procurements like we needed to. Uh, and so ultimately, we found ourselves without some packaging that we needed. Uh, you'll notice the packaging actually changed over the last couple of weeks. Uh, and so that put us behind. We used to have a stockpile of these kits on hand. Uh, we're currently producing these kits every day. You've seen the call for volunteers to help us produce these kits. Uh, and that's just the reality of that. You know, we got behind because of our lack of ability to do emergency procurement. So I don't know that you really satisfied my answer there. So do, do you have enough? Can you give us a number? Do you have enough? Are you concerned that you're going to have to start limiting these to D.C. residents like you limit the rapid tests? We are not concerned. We have plenty of raw materials on hand now. Uh, and so, you know, we're putting them out. But again, we want people to be friendly to their neighbors. And then my last question, could you tell people how they could volunteer? I know you're calling for both volunteers to help assemble the kits and then for landlords to provide space to some of these future pop-up sites. Can you tell how people could help in either of those two efforts? Sure. No, thanks for the opportunity. That's a great question, Mark. Uh, so we do have on Twitter. Uh, so if you follow Mayor Bowser's uh, Twitter account, 
uh, you can see the link to go ahead and sign up to be able to build those test kits. Uh, and so we'll be doing that through the through this week. Um, and you can you can sign up there. Uh, we have shifts all throughout the day. Uh, likewise, as we mentioned yesterday, we're working on COVID service centers in the community. Uh, and so you can go to retailspace.dc.gov to volunteer uh, or to provide a recommendation of space that we might be able to use in the community. We're looking for about five to 10,000 square feet of open space that we can set up these sites in the community. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, a couple more for me. There's been a lot of information presented over the past couple of days. I'm hoping you can just recap for everybody. What has the city done knowing about the new variant, knowing about the surge that's expected this month to make sure testing capacity is at the level it needs to be? And also with hospitals, how can we be sure that our hospitals aren't going to see the type of surge capacity issues that we've seen in even neighboring states? Yeah, thanks, Michael. Uh, so, you know, we talked about yesterday at the press conference our test turnaround time. And so we have tremendous amount of test capacity uh, with our, our providers in the community. And again, about a third of that comes from our public testing. Uh, but the DC has had one of the most accessible uh, public testing programs in the country, right? We have 36 locations now that you can get test yourselves at. That makes it, we used to say it was within a 20 minute walk of everyone within the city or ev almost everyone in the city. Uh, now it's even less than that. Uh, you, you can't find that anywhere else in the country, right? Uh, we're now expanding our Test Yourself Express program. We've been trying for many months uh, to be able to start the antigen test program. Uh, we talked about our disappointment of not being able to do that when our neighbors in Virginia and Maryland did that. But here we are today, now that we're able to make those procurements and get that through, we've got supply. Uh, we've got the, the kits are coming they're, they're, you know We know that a million of them are coming. So we've been making those orders for a while. We've got uh, tremendous amounts of test tubes available to do this testing available in the community. Um, we've been ramping up opportunities to, to do vaccine uh, and testing in the community as well. With regards to our hospitals, uh, we've been talking to our hospitals since March of 2020. Uh, we routinely have conversations with them almost daily. We're having conversations with those hospitals to understand what they're seeing in their facilities. Uh, we have had conversations with the hospital associations as well as our other healthcare partners because it's not just about the hospitals, it's about the entire system. Uh, we talked to them this morning. Uh, the CEOs all met this morning as well. Uh, and and the, you know, they, they feel comfortable that they're able to meet this surge. Okay, interesting. So there's no, I mean, I remember we had the, the convention center basement as the possible uh, extra hospital area. Is there any thought we might need to re-implement something like that? Yeah. Yeah, so the, it's a great question, Michael. And so our, our challenge uh, actually with, with healthcare in general these days is not about space. Uh, and so we know that, uh, you know, opening the convention center uh, would not would not necessarily bring us any more resources because it's staffing that hospitals are having challenges with. Uh, that's not here in D.C. That's everywhere across the country. And so we have plenty of space. We also know that our healthcare care systems here in D.C. Uh, have robust staffing available to them. Uh, it's something we're monitoring on a daily basis. We don't feel the need to stand up the convention center anymore. Uh, we also know that our hospitalization rates are down tremendously. Right. Uh, so less than five percent of the individuals that contract covid are now in the hospital. We've gotten better at treating them. Their length of stay is down. We've got monoclonal antibodies. We've got other therapeutics as well that allow people to be treated uh, and not end up in the hospital like we saw uh, in 2020. Thank you. Cool. Thank you.